Hello, everyone. What we're going to talk about in this lecture is the first bicellular process that is shared among all living organisms. And this is that process that is done either in full or in part of it uh, to produce the energy, which is necessary for all living organisms to sustain ultimately their uh, metabolism. So a brief overview here, what we're going to talk about here. First, we'll talk about some chemical facts, uh, which are the background facts of cellular respiration. I'll we'll go through a quick overview of cellular respiration itself and all the different steps. Talk first about glycolysis and the power of it oxidation and the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. Then we'll finish up with the oxidative phosphorylation. Together with that, then later on, we'll figure out how efficient is cellular respiration in percentage. So how much of that energy, the potential energy in the starting molecule, glucose, is actually retrieved by this process. And we'll finish up talking about uh, how um, cellular respiration is done in the absence of oxygen and in different types of organisms. So chemical, some of the chemical basis here of cellular respiration. So if we have to define cellular respiration, we can define it as the set of metabolic reaction that basically transfer the energy from some energy-rich molecules. And I want to stress energy-rich molecules. We always teach the full cellular respiration, starting from glucose all the way to carbon dioxide and water. But in reality, this applies, and I'll show you through the talk, it applies to many other molecules. It applies also to fatty acids, to other monosaccharides, to amino acids, which might enter the process of cellular respiration at different steps. So it's not just about glucose. Full cellular respiration, yes, start from glucose and through carbon dioxide and water, but it applies to many other molecules. So cellular respiration is the set of metabolic reaction where these ener the potential energy in these energy-rich molecules is transferred to ATP. So that living organism can have now some energy that can quickly be used to perform ultimately those endergonic processes. So those non-spontaneous processes such as protein synthesis, or movement of material against concentration, and so on, as we talked about in the thermodynamics lecture. Now, one common theme of the energy-rich molecules or the parts of the energy-rich molecules from which the energy is taken is that they're very abundant in bonds between carbon and hydrogen and carbon-carbon. Why is carbon-hydrogen such a great source of energy? To understand that, we have to understand one thing, is that the energy that is taken, the potential energy that is taken in this process ultimately corresponds to the energy that is stored in the electrons involved in these chemical bonds. The energy, accessible energy, there is energy in the nuclei too, but it's not really accessible. But the energy that can be used there and can be retrieved is the one in the electron in these bonds. So why are carbon-hydrogen bonds better than other bonds such as carbon and oxygen? to retrieve the energy. Well, it depends on how tight these electrons are held. The example I give you here, so this corresponds to what a pickpocket does to take a wallet. So it would be much easier for a pickpocketer to take a wallet from a person that is not holding this wallet tight as another person does, a person that has this, uh, this um, hidden purses attached to their body. Same thing for the electrons carrying the energy here. So the electrons in a carbon-hydrogen bonds are not held very tightly by either ca neither carbon or hydrogen because neither one has strong electronegativity. So these electrons can actually fairly easily be retrieved or moved away. It's different from a bond carbon-oxygen where you have, in this case, a molecule or an element, sorry, an atom oxygen that has high electronegativity. So it's holding to this electron much, much more tightly. This electron ultimately would have a little bit less energy compared to these ones too. So it's much harder to retrieve them and therefore the energy associated with them. Now, how are these electrons retrieved? 
is through a series of combined reactions where these electrons with their energy are transferred from some molecules to another one. These reactions are referred to as oxidation when the electrons are taken away from, so from a molecule transferred to another one. So when they're the molecule that loses the electron is referred to as an oxidized molecule. In this case, is giving the energy away. Whereas a molecule that is taken, this electron is referred to as a reduced molecule. In this case, is acquiring energy. And this movement can be not definitely from one molecule of the electrons from one molecule to the other one, but also within the same molecule, where you refer to as a partial gain. I'll show you an example later. Now, these two reactions where the electrons are taken away is referred to as an oxidation, where the electrons are transferred to another molecule is referred to as a reduction. And they always work together. You always have a combination of a reduction and an oxidation reaction. So we always talk about redox reactions, so the combination, the couple, reduction, oxidation reaction. Below, you have an example which applies to what we're talking about here. In this case, this not ref does not refer to a reaction, I want to stress, but to the full process, cellular respiration. So it's multiple reactions. But here, too, you have that basically glucose is oxidized, so the electrons from glucose are taken okay forming carbon dioxide and they are transferred to oxygen as an ultimate uh, ultimate acceptor which then is reduced into water together with some protons as well so always there is always a combination of oxidation and reduction and that cell respiration is a series of redox reactions combined together that leads to the retrieval of the energy from glucose for the full pathway. This is a picture that shows exactly what I told you before. So in redox, we actually have some molecule that loses the electrons, so it's oxidized through the oxidation reaction. At the same time, these electrons are transferred to another molecule that um, gets reduced. Now, these results in release of energy. And again, the energy is coming from these electrons, and it comes from the movement of these electrons from a higher level of energy to a lower, a lower level of energy. So when this happens, there is some energy that is released, and this can be captured to either produce ATP, produce heat in different or different things. So there is the release of energy. Now, another thing I want to stress on is that this movement of electrons is not always full. So there is not a full transfer from one molecule to the other one. It can be moved also uh for the same element in a different way so for example here you have the reaction this is a redox reaction of methane oxidized with oxygen forming carbon dioxide it's happening on your stove if you have a natural gas stove so what happens there is that these electrons now in carbon they're not fully transferred they still stay attached to carbon you see but now the change from hydrogen to oxygen as the um element that were uh, these electrons are shared to leads to basically a partial gain of electrons by oxygen leads to the electrons ending up being held tighter by oxygen going to a lower level of energy and still releasing some energy which is why you get flame when you burn methane so it's that the, the movement of these electrons doesn't have to be full all the time it can be partial within either the same molecule or with an exchange of elements but still can stay attached to the same element like in this case carbon now not surprisingly these electrons oftentimes they end up in oxygen such in cellular respiration they end up to oxygen the reason be that it's highly electronegative once it captures these electrons it helps them so tightly they are very hard to retrieve any further energy from these electrons by taking them away. So now let's move to cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is a series of redox reactions, okay, which ultimately form an exergonic process. So it's a spontaneous process, that's why it happens, which releases free energy. So the change in delta G or Gibbs free energy
is minus 686 kilocalories per mole. Keep this value in mind because at the end of the lecture, we'll calculate how efficient is cellular respiration by comparing how much of this energy is in the transfer to ATP and how much is lost. Now, in order to minimize the energy loss through this process, which consists of several reactions, this process has been broken into several steps, several reactions. Why? Because it's much easier to retrieve the energy when you have less energy release at the time than when you have a huge amount of release all in a single reaction. So for this reason, this is broken down into different steps. You'll see which are a part of glycolysis, part of it oxidation, and so on. Breaking it down makes it easier to actually capture more of the total energy released by this process. Now you see an important thing is that now the energy coming from these energy-rich molecule, glucose here, in reality is not transferred directly to produce ATP. That's a misconception oftentimes uh, the beginning students have is, oh yeah, the energy is transferred to ATP uh, directly. No, this is not really true. Only a small amount of the energy you'll see is transferred directly to ATP through substrate for phosphorylation. So meaning that Actually, the phosphate group is transferred from one substrate to another, to the ADP. Only very little energy is produced like that. Most of the energy is, is uh, produced, so most of the ATP, by first transferring the energy, so the electrons from glucose to uh, two uh, molecules, NAD plus and FAD, which then become NADH and FADH2. So the Energy is temporarily stored in this molecule, which then is used in the last step of cellular uh, respiration, which is oxidative phosphorylation, to produce the largest amount of A. So most of the energy gets first transferred, and then it's used to produce the large amount of ATP. Direct substrate phosphorylation is only a minimal part of these process. Now, what are FAD and NADH? So these are coenzymes, okay? So these are molecules that basically help enzymes. You remember coenzymes are those molecules that some enzymes need in order to perform their function. And so as you can see, this is the structure of NAD+. It's nothing else than basically a modified nucleotide which has one part here, nicotinamide. You don't need to remember this structure, by the way, but you have to remember the function of NAD+. As a structure here where you have two elements, this carbon and this nitrogen, that can bind electrons. So you can have one electron bound by this carbon, bound by this nitrogen here. And together with that, now you have that this carbon can bind also a proton. So NAD+, can easily reduce so can easily transfer electrons and therefore energy forming this reduced form called NADH and then this energy is not very tightly stored can easily be released again so you don't want this electron to end up uh, being unremovable in the end can easily be released so NADH can be oxidized back to NAD plus releasing the electrons and the energy associated with that so each NADH molecule, NADH, sorry, <coughs> NAD plus molecule can bind two electrons and one hydrogen. So it can be used to temporarily store the energy by binding these electrons. Similarly, sorry, I'm going to drink some water. Similarly, uh, FADH or flavin adenine dinucleotide <coughs> can also temporarily be reduced by binding two electrons in this case, to these two nitrogen um, elements here, forming FADH2. And then these element, these electrons can be also released again, reforming the oxidized form of FD. Together with that, <coughs> excuse me, there are also two uh, protons that are bound by FAD uh, to, convert to, uh, to be reduced and vice versa released when it gets oxidized. So both NADH or NAD plus and FAD can be used to temporarily store the energy by basically giving them two electrons at that time. 
Let's go through the different steps <coughs> of cellular respiration. So in bulk here, cellular respiration can be divided into three phases. The first one is glycolysis. This is the most ancient pathway present in living organisms. And some living organisms are limited to glycolysis. This is performed in the cytoplasm. Together with that, organisms that have mitochondria perform also the second step, which is pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycles, also referred to as Krebs cycle, and then oxidative phosphorylation, where the big bulk of ATP is actually made. So both the second step, pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation are performed in the mitochondria. So quick look at the mitochondrial structures, trying to give you some orientation where these processes happen. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, the rest in the mitochondria. Now, in terms of structure, mitochondria, if you recall, they have two membranes. They have an external or outer membrane, and inside they have a second membrane referred to as the inner membrane. This membrane is very, uh, very, very well folded. The reason being that it's folded is that basically maximizes the surface for the electron transfer chain and the process of oxidative phosphorylation. So the more membrane you have, the more of this process you can perform. So this extends inside the mitochondria, forming what we call the Cri state. Now, inside of the mitochondria, that's where the Krebs cycle takes place, so the vast majority of it, it's referred to as the matrix. Now, another important space that you have in the mitochondria is what is called the intermembrane space. Is the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane here. This is where the protons you'll see at the end through the oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transfer chain first, the protons are stored inside this space. I'll repeat it later on, so you don't have to remember everything. But that's a space where all the protons can be accumulated and then used to produce ATP later on. Let's go through the first state, uh, step, glycolysis. Again, this is the most ancient metabolic pathway present in all living organisms. Some organism, that's the only pathway that basically they use to produce ATP with. Now, glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. So all the enzymes are actually soluble in the cytoplasm and consists of 10 different reactions. Ultimately, what happens there, starting from glucose, which is a six carbon molecules, you have that glucose is oxidized into two, three carbon molecules, which are called pyruvate. So two pyruvate molecules. So in total, there is no carbon loss for this process. There is also no use of oxygen. So these pathway, these 10 reactions corresponding to glycolysis can take place whether there is or there is not oxygen, because there is no required for oxygen to be present. Now, glycolysis, as I said before, consists of 10 reactions. The first five, in reality, are endergonic reactions. So, no, they're not endergonic reactions. They're a set of five reactions which all together form an endergonic pathway. So, if you combine together the delta G of all the different reactions, you will get an endergonic value, so a value of delta G higher than zero. So the first five reactions are naturally not spontaneous. They're made spontaneous by using some ATP. That's the reason why they're called five energy requiring reactions, because ATP has to be used to make that process exergonic from endergonic. So there is no energy produced in these five reactions, but the energy is produced in the following five reactions where instead is correspond to the exergonic part of glycolysis, energy is released and it's used to produce at this point four ATP molecules. And some of the energy, instead of being used to produce ATP, is temporarily stored in two NADH molecules. The electrons are transferred there to be used later on in the last phase of cellular respiration. So as a result, if you put all together glycolysis, ultimately, lead to the production of two ATP molecules and two NADH molecules. So the energy in glucose that gets broken down into pyruvate gets trapped into overall two ATP molecules and 
to NADH molecules. This picture shows you the different reactions part of glycolysis, all the 10 reactions in there. Now, you don't need to remember these reactions, okay? So I'm not gonna test you on this part, but I want you to remember some key features. First of all, these in red correspond to the energy requiring reaction. So basically what they lead to is the first phosphorylation of glucose and conversion into fructose and so on. And the formation of this key intermediate, which I want you to remember, which is glycerhaldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, so that's the end point of the energy requiring reaction. So all of this is an endergonic process made exergonic by the use of two ATP molecule here, which are first used to phosphorylate the intermediate molecules produced. Now, why I want you to remember glycerhaldehyde 3-phosphate is for two reasons. First of all, because you see that this is actually the entry point of other molecules into cellular respiration. For example, glycerol, which is uh, the, one of the building block of glycerides, or triglycerides and so on, actually can enter, be used to produce energy by entering, being converted first in glycerhaldehyde 3-phosphate, so entering the cellular respiration here. It's just to stress on the fact that cellular respiration it's not just used for to use glucose. Another place where other molecules can enter is here. Look at fructose 6-phosphate here. I hope you can see how you can easily get fructose as well, so another monosaccharide, to enter this pathway by just phosphorylating, by just adding a phosphate group to uh, fructose. It will produce fructose 6-phosphate, so fructose with its phosphate group attached to carbon 6 and then fructose could enter the um, cellular respiration at this point. So just to show you how different molecules can actually enter this process. Another thing I want you to remember here, at least for the energy requiring part, is this enzyme here, phosphofructokinase. You see towards the end of the lecture when we talk about the regulation of cellular respiration, how this is the target of allosteric inhibition or activation by some products of cellular respiration. So once the energy requiring step is done, so these five reactions, they lead to the formation of two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. And now, after that, you have the set of five energy-releasing molecules that ultimately convert glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates into pyruvate. So in this case here, you have first that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate get phosphorylated again, not through the use of ATP, but through the use of inorganic phosphate. And then these phosphate attached here are used ultimately to tr are transferred to ADP at these two kinases, phosphoglycerate kinase and pyruvate kinase. You don't need to remember these names, but I want you to visualize where the ATP is formed. So these phosphate are transferred now to ADP molecules forming finally ATP. So you have two ATP molecules formed for each glycerhaldehyde 3-phosphate molecule. Since you have two of them, two of the G3P form from glucose, you would have four ATP molecules formed right here. Together with that, you also have one molecule per glycerhaldehyde 3-phosphate of NADH produced in this, so two in total in this first step. So as a result, this original endergonic process made exergonic through the use of ATP, and this exergonic process here, energy releasing process, you have the glucose that first converted into glycerhydride 3-phosphate and finally into pyruvate. All throughout this, you have ultimately two molecules of ATP being produced, four minus these two, and two NADH uh, molecules as well produced. So all of these molecules do contain some of the energy coming from glucose. Now, part of it itself still contains a lot of energy, okay? And that's the molecule that ultimately is going to be brought after being modified uh, into the Krebs cycle. So this molecule in the next step, which is a um, part of it, oxidation, will be brought into the mitochondria and then ultimately into the Krebs cycle. One thing I want to stress on is how this way of making ATP so is by transferring a phosphate group 
from one substrate to the other one, which will be ADP. So for this reason, this process of production of ATP is referred to as substrate level phosphorylation. So the phosphate group is transferred from one molecule to ADP, forming ultimately ATP. This is very different from the way ATP is formed in the last step of cellular respiration, which is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation instead of substrate level phosphorylation. So, pyruvate, the product of glycolysis, then in some organisms, not all of them, okay, only those that have mitochondria, such as ourselves, and then be transferred in the next step of cellular respiration, referred to as pyruvate oxidation, can be transferred into the mitochondria first, or a specific transporter in the inner membrane, to get transferred into the matrix of the mitochondria, and then there it gets first converted into uh, acetate ultimately uh, by removing a molecule of carbon dioxide. So you have two pyruvate, so two molecules of carbon dioxide being produced in this step for each glucose molecules. And then the remaining part, so this carbon dioxide, carbon to oxygen gets removed, and then this rest of the molecule get transferred another coenzyme which is called coenzyme a this molecule right here you don't need to remember the structure by doing that but the molecule that is formed is called acetyl coenzyme b this is an important step because pyruvate by itself or acetate cannot enter the um, um uh, citric acid cycle it has to be combined to the coenzyme A for the very first step of the citric acid cycle to take place. So the molecule here, pyruvate, has been reduced from a three carbon molecule to a two carbon molecule and has been prepared by binding it to coenzyme A to enter the Krebs cycle. Together with that, you also have that this process leads to the formation of one NADH molecule for each pyruvate molecule. So in total, it will be two. NADH for each glucose molecule, since each glucose molecule produced two pyruvate molecules. The next step is the citric acid cycle. So this consists of eight different reactions, with seven of them done by enzyme, which are uh, soluble inside the matrix. And one of them is that one of these enzymes, so one of the reactions done with an enzyme, which is attached to the inner membrane surface. Now, this ultimately leads to the oxidation of the acetyl group, this group right here, which contains two carbons into two carbon dioxide molecules. Together with that, the energy present in these bonds is used to produce some ATP, very little ATP, but many or many, uh, some NADH and FADH molecules. So some of the electrons are transferred again, are banked into NADH, FADH2, which will be used in the last step, which is oxidative phosphorylation. This picture shows you all the reaction of this cycle. It's called a cycle because ultimately, once uh, acetyl coenzyme A enters here, it leads to the production of carbon dioxide and so on, but also leads to the production of mallet as well, which re-enter the series of reactions. So, leads to a production of so to one of the substrate needed for this cycle to happen. So you don't need to remember these reactions. If you want to show off, go ahead, memorize them. Uh, but you'll do them in more detail if you take biochemistry course uh, later on. What I want you to see in all of these is what happens ultimately to the um, acetyl coenzyme here, which is entering this cycle. So first it gets combined with four carbon molecule forming a six carbon molecule, which is citrate here. Now, once this is done, the coenzyme A has been released. You can see the coenzyme A, A was necessary for this enzyme to actually bind, get the acetyl group to be combined with oxaloacetate. That's the reason why it's called a coenzyme. It helps this enzyme to work. And so once it's entered there, now you have the six carbon molecule citrate, which get converted first into isocitrate, and then the energy start being released there. Okay, so first you have one carboxy group, 
here, which gets removed in the form of, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, of um, carbon dioxide, sorry. And this energy that's released here is banked, so the electrons here in this carbon-carbon bond are basically banked into an ADH, an ADH molecule here. Now, another carbon dioxide group here gets removed as well. Carbon uh, coenzyme A gets into this picture too. So now you have another carbon dioxide molecule here that gets released. And these ultimately, this one right here, transferring of this group to coenzyme A, carbon dioxide form electrons transfer to NAD, NAD plus and forming NADH again. So a second NADH molecule for each acetyl coenzyme group here. Together with that, now you have some more ATP that is formed in the next step. In this case, the phosphate group uh, or the energy is used, released here, is not transferred directly to ATP, but is transferred first to GTP and then to EP, producing one ATP molecule. And then you have another series of steps here, which ultimately lead to the banking of some more electrons into FADH2 and NADH2 here. Okay, so as a result, in all of this cycle, so you have that one acetyl coenzyme molecule has entered the cycle here, producing for each acetyl coenzyme molecule. So you would have two of them for each glucose, right? Produced at the beginning. For each acetyl coenzyme molecule here, you have the production of three NADH molecules, one, two, and three, one FADH molecule here and two carbon dioxide molecules, please, sorry, and one ATP as well. So in terms of energy molecules, you have three NADH, one FADH, and one ATP molecule produced here with the production of two carbon dioxide molecules here. So altogether, since you have two coenzyme A for each glucose molecule that are produced, you would have at this point produced six NADH, two FADH2, two ATP molecule and four carbon dioxide molecule formed here. Uh, so this is the energy overall um, combination or production of the citric acid cycle. Again, I, you don't need to remember the single um, reactions. You need to remember what is happening. So ultimately remember that acetyl coenzyme A is turned, each molecule is turned into two carbon dioxide. So it's basically is broken down and the remaining energy it's released and banked into one ATP molecule, one FADH2, and one, uh, sorry, three NADH uh, molecule. Okay. Obviously, there are two cycles for each glucose molecule, so you multiply everything by two. Now, we have had some ATP produced by all this step, but extremely little ATP. Look, one molecule here. And then basically two produced through the um, to the um, so two produced here for each acetyl coenzyme and two produced through glycolysis. That's it. Very little. In reality, cellular respiration produces much more ATP. How? By taking this molecule, the energy in this, and transfer it into ATP. In this case, though, this process is a little more complicated. So what happens to the L that being banked in these steps and the previous steps into NADH and FDH2? Well, they get used through the process of oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP through two different steps. First, the electrons here in NADH and FDH2 are used to generate basically an electron flow through what is called the electron transport chain. These leads to the formation of a proton gradient. I'll show you everything in the next few slides, which then is used to produce ATP through chemiosmosis. Let's look at the different step. First of all, where does the electron transfer uh, chain takes place? So the oxidative phosphorylation process takes place in the inner membrane of mitochondria. Remember, this is folded into crestate. And so this is done through a series of complexes, we'll see them in the next slide, having this crestate, so this invagination of the membrane or uh, uh, folding of the membrane there, expand the surface. So you expand 
the efficiency of all this process. You can do it much more efficiently. So how is it going to work here? Well, we have these electrons in NADH and FADH2 produced by the previous steps of cellular respiration, which now can be released, and the energy associated with that can be grabbed and converted into ATP. How is it grabbed? So first of all, these electrons here are taken by a series of complexes generating an electron flow. Now, these complexes that you find in the electron transfer chains are four. These are complexes of different proteins and prosthetic groups. Complex one is the one that takes the electrons ultimately from NADH. All of them are embedded in the cell membrane. Oh, the, sorry, one, three, and four. Second one, it will be a peripheral type of complex. These, so it's complex one, referred to also as NADH. Uh, the, the hydrogenase, but you can remember as complex one, is the one that takes the electrons from NADH. So NADH releases electrons here. And you have a complex two here, this one right here, that takes instead the electrons from FADH2. Now, the electrons are then shuffled, so you can turn two, to a third complex, complex three, which is referred to as cytochrome complex, and then through cytochrome C, they're shuffled to the fourth complex, which is complex four. So this creates an electron flow here, okay? So from NADH or FADH through, so an, hence the electron transport chain, which ultimately they end up to oxygen. So from complex, complex four, finally these electrons are given to oxygen, forming water. That's the water you get from the cellular respiration equation that we always give you, the six molecular water. So some of the six are coming from this process. So again, the function of these complexes is to generate this electron flow that ultimately goes from NADH or FADH2. Notice how they enter again in two different complexes. This has a, causes a difference in terms of um, um, energy, uh, overall energy production, these two molecules, and is transferred to water. Okay, so together with that, these complexes, as I mentioned before, you have two shuffle uh, complexes or shuffle molecules, as you say. One is ubiquinone. These are very hydrophobic molecules that can bind electrons and protons. And it's used to basically transfer those electrons that were first transferred from NADH to complex one or FADH2 to complex two, to shuffle them in this phospholipid bilayer to the next complex, complex three. So the movement of electrons will be from complex one, NADH, to complex three through ubiquinone, or from complex two to complex three through ubiquinone. Together with that, ubiquinone, also when it binds electrons, it binds also a proton on the matrix of the mitochondria, and once he releases the protons, he releases, uh, sorry, the electron releases the proton too in the intermembrane space. It's important to remember that as well later for you see the point later on. Same thing for cytochrome C. Cytochrome C transfer the uh, electrons from complex three to complex four. Something that cannot be done directly is done by cytochrome C, which is basically nothing else than a protein with the prosthetic group, a heme group, like a hemoglobin, so with an iron that can accept the electrons inside here. Now, all of these complexes plus the shuffle molecules, ubiquinone and cytochrome C, creates a flow of electrons from NADH and FADH2, which progressively releases energy. Okay, so each, this is held by prosthetic groups inside the complexes, containing um, elements such as iron that can be reduced or oxidized. So we bind the electrons and then we transfer to the next one, oxidizing itself, then can accept another electron and so on. So they will go back and forth from their uh, oxidated, um, uh, oxidated uh, uh, state to the reduced state, uh, oxidized, sorry, to reduced state back and forth. And by doing that, they will take the electron release to the next complex and so on. This creates a flow, ultimately, 
which goes from high energy to low energy. That's the reason why this happens. Again, this is an exergonic process. It needs to be exergonic. So it creates this flow of electrons from these molecules all the way to oxygen forming water. Now, why is this done? This is not done for fun. Again, these electrons here, they had energy gets released. How is this energy ultimately translated into production of ATP? It's done by first doing one important step, which is pumping protons. This release of energy taking place here, it's used to pump protons basically from the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space. Now, this leads to the accumulation of protons here. So these protons are moved by the complex one, moves one proton for each electron. Ubiquinone moves one proton as well, shuffling these electrons from complex one to three, or complex two to three. And then you have also that complex four can pump protons. So this leads to the formation of a difference in concentration of protons on this side compared to the matrix side. Formation of water too reduces the amount of protons here, increasing this differential of concentration of protons. So now these translate into what is called a proton multiforce. So this different concentration of protons in the intermembrane space, which will be on this side, compared to the matrix, basically has two big, um, produce two big types of force. One, it corresponds to the difference in concentration. The concentration gradient of protons already per se has, contains energy in the form of entropy, do you remember? The second thing also causes an uneven distribution of charge across the two sides of the membrane. So you have more positive charges in the intermembrane space compared to the matrix. This basically leads to the formation of a voltage difference of 0.14 volts. You don't need to remember the volume, but just to give an idea. So the combination of the chemical concentration gradient and the voltage difference here is referred to as the protomotive force. So it's a force that drives movement of protons. That's what it means. Why is this important? Because now you have all of this energy corresponding to the protomotive force which then can be freed or used to ultimately produce ATP. How is this done? It's done through this amazing, tiny, extremely efficient engine, which is ATP synthesis. You see this complex. It's a complex of different peptides. It's also used in photosynthesis, exactly the same. So now, ATP synthesis is this complex that consists of two basic main parts. There's a basal unit here, which is attached inside the um, phospholipid bilayer. And then it has a headpiece here. Now, the basal unit can actually let protons go through. So these protons here that have been accumulated in the intermembrane space, which will be on this side, now they can go through the ATP synthase to the basal unit. When they do that, they actually bind temporarily and that they get released on the other side. By doing that, they transfer their energy, do you remember, due to the difference in concentration gradient and voltage, gets released into the basal unit here and the stock here, which then can rotate. You need three to four protons here to bind to this unit to cause a rotation. So this engine basically rotates. When it rotates, then it transfers the energy to the headpiece. And then this mechanical energy, this kinetic energy, gets converted into a bond between a phosphate group and ADP forming ATP. So this little energy here ultimately translates this protomotion force. So the protons are moving through the uh, base unit here, binding temporarily and getting released. So releasing this energy here and transferring to this bond here, forming ATP. So you need three to four of these protons to bind here to form one ATP molecule. This ref uh, process is overall referred to as chemiosmosis. And ATP produced in this step differently from the substrate level phosphorylation. Do you remember the dimension? 
when we talked about um, um, glycolysis, ATP in this case, it's formed through uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Now, sometimes this process gets uncoupled. So this process here, so ultimately, production of this differential in proto-concentration between the intermembrane space and the matrix is used to produce ATP. Sometimes this production of ATP, it's uncoupled. So basically it stops how? By adding to the phospholipid bilayer, some molecules could be pro uh, proteins that allow for the proteins to be released directly through the membrane instead of going through the ATP scientists. This is referred to as uncoupling of the electron transport. And the reason why this is done is done, for example, by uh, bears in what is called the brown uh, fat tissue. Even uh, babies, human babies, they can do that, temporarily can do that. And this is done because basically releasing this protomotive force here, instead of to produce ATP, by releasing directly, it will cause the production of heat. So it can be used to quickly produce heat when you are in need. For example, babies, honey babies, they can shiver. We produce heat when we're cold, we start shivering. And the reason is that that contraction of the muscle causes some energy loss, which corresponds to heat. Babies can do that. And so they can actually uncouple electron transport, sometimes temporarily, to produce that heat necessary to keep them alive. Now, what is the final efficiency of cellular respiration? So we went through glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, and then we have arrived to the uh, oxidative phosphorylation step, the last one. How much of all the original energy at the beginning, so present in glucose, is ultimately retrieved in the form of ATP through this process? If you remember at the beginning, I told you that cellular respiration releases altogether 686 kilocalories per mole. It's an exergonic process, release all this amount of energy. So this is all the energy that was present in the original glucose molecule. It has been released through all these processes all the way to the production of carbon dioxide and water. In reality, how much of this energy really gets captured through these steps that we discussed and transfer into ATP and how much gets lost. You remember, there is always loss of energy in every step. Now, how can we calculate? Once we calculate that, we can calculate overall the efficiency of cellular respiration. Now, we know, you remember from the previous lecture, that each ATP molecule can store 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Remember, if you break down ATP into ADP, this is the energy that gets released with a negative value because it's an ex exergonic reaction. If you do the opposite, if you actually attach a phosphate group to ADP, then this will be an endergonic process corresponding to plus 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Now, if you can calculate the total number of ATP molecules produced by cellular respiration, you know how much energy is stored in each one of them, multiply the two, you can figure out how much of this total energy ultimately really gets stored in ATP. Now, summarizing on this table, how many energy molecules have been produced through all the steps that we discussed. We have seen that glycolysis produced two ATP molecules directly. Together with that, produce also two NADH molecules. Arbate oxidation produced two NADH molecules, and the citric acid cycle produced TP molecules, 3-NADH, and 2-FADH molecules. So all of these steps have produced directly two ATP four ATP molecules. In reality, you'll see later on that to uh, transfer this NADH into the mitochondria, you lose two ATP molecules. So this actually will be a value of two. But together with that, there are 10 NADH molecules and FADH2 molecules. Now, through the process of oxidative phosphorylation, how many ATP molecules are ultimately produced by these 10 NADH molecule and FADH2 molecules? How can we calculate that? Well, we know that the ATPase, that small engine, that's the protomotive force, so the movement of protons through the membrane, 
to generate ATP can produce one ATP molecule per three, four protons. Okay, so it can produce one rotation using three, four protons going through the membrane leading to the formation of one ATP molecule. Now we know that NADH, once it releases its electrons to the electron transfer chain to complex one, generates overall each NADH molecule the pumping of 10 protons across them. Now, FDH shows pumping of a little bit less, seven. The reason be that it enters on complex two instead of complex one. And complex one can move the protons, complex two does not move the protons across the membrane. You can go back and see that later on. So if NADH, each NADH moves 10 protons and three, four of them are needed per rotation, you can calculate that roughly one NADH molecule can produce three ATP molecules. Three rotation, therefore three ATP molecules. We had 10 of them produced through the process. So altogether, the NADH produced should be able to generate 30 ATP molecules together. Now, FADH2 pumps seven. You need three, four of them for each ATP molecule. So each FADH2 can produce two ATP molecules. Let's say it, you have two FADH2 produced throughout all cellular respiration. So altogether, it could equally lead to the formation of four ATP molecules. Now, if you can combine these 30 ATP molecules to these four, to the four produced by cellular respiration. So now we have 30 ATP molecules produced here, four here, plus this four. Then there are two ATP molecules that are used to actually move this NADH, which is in the cytoplasm originally, into the mitochondria to participate in the oxidative force formulation. So you have 38 ATP molecules in the end together. Minus two will be 36. Now we know each ATP molecule can store 7.3 kilocalories per mole. So if you multiply all of these together, you get all the energy, starting from the potential energy, how much energy of this 686 kilocalories per mole originally present in glucose, how much energy has been actually really retrieved. If you do this calculation, you see that the process of cellular respiration ultimately leads to almost 40% of energy retrieval. Notice that some of these values are slightly different depending on the source that you get. I'm using the one from your box for this. So cellular respiration has an efficiency of about 40% meaning that a little bit more than 60% of that original energy had actually lost, not surprisingly. Despite that, this is an extremely efficient, efficient path. To be able to retrieve 40% of the energy is extremely incredible. It's a huge, huge number compared to many other processes that are done in the cell. So summarizing what we discussed here in cellular respiration, then we move on the regulation and so on. The three step. The first step is glycolysis. This step takes place in the cytoplasm, and there you have the glucose that ultimately oxidizes into two pyruvate molecules through 10 reaction, if you remember, 10 energy consuming reaction, five, sorry, energy consuming reaction, which need two ATP molecules to happen. And then you have five energy releasing reactions that do produce four ATP molecules and two NADH molecules. So the overall energy um, production of glycolysis is two ATP molecules and two NADH molecules. So some of the energy was transferred into NADH. And that part of it in the next step, through pyruvate oxidation, gets moved into the mitochondria. There it gets oxidized, some carbon dioxide is produced, and two acetyl enzyme A molecule are produced for each molecule of glucose. In this process, there is also some NADH that gets produced there. And then acetyl coenzyme A finally can enter the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, which then releases some more energy. Some of it gets used to produce ATP. Some other get banked again in six in NADH and FADH2 molecules. Together with that, the two carbon um, acetyl molecule here is broken down into carbon dioxide. Here you get the six carbon dioxide molecule produced by cellular respiration. Let's say 
Now, there's still a lot of energy here left in the form of NADH and FADH2 that can be banked to the final step, which is oxidative phosphorylation, where you have electron transfer chain. So these electrons here are put through the electron transfer chain by entering either in complex one with NADH or complex through, through sorry, through FADH2. This leads to the transfer of this electron in an exergonic process all the way to oxygen, forming water. This process is then used to generate, to move protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space, generating what is called a proton motive force, which then is used by ATP scientists through chemiosmosis to produce ATP. This is the process where the vast majority of ATP ultimately is produced. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a process that it's always described in some way. I really like it. It's always described as glucose oxidized with six molecules of oxygen producing six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. As if glucose is the only molecule that is used in this process. No, this process having multiple steps allows for the entries of several other energy rich molecules in the process. For example, Many six carbon sugars can enter. Fructose can enter. If you remember, there is a, um, um, fructose six phosphate in glycolysis can enter in glycolysis. So many other monosaccharides can enter through glycolysis. Um, triglycerides too can enter here. So they get usually separated first into fatty acid and glycerol. Glycerol can be converted into glyceraldehyde three phosphate which you remember, if you remember, is that compound in the middle of glycolysis, the one that separates the energy requiring from the energy releasing uh, reactions. So you can enter there, glycerol itself. Fatty acids usually are broken down into two carbon molecules, which can get combined with coenzyme A, forming acetyl coenzyme A. So they can enter at the level of the citric acid cycle. And then, the, Amino acids can actually be, um, uh, first they get the amino group removed and then they can be modified in different ways and enter it. If you look at the pathway here in different level, uh, to, uh, the pyruvate level or the acetyl coenzyme A, uh, as co acetyl coenzyme A or directly as one of the components of the citric acid cycle. So there, these pathway, this process, allows for retrieving energy from many different molecules other than glucose that can enter at different points. And this is already discussed before. Now, at the same time, keep in mind, these pathways lead to the production of so many compounds. So you can see how other than being used to produce energy, it can also be used to produce these intermediate compounds that can actually e exit the cellular respiration to be used to produce other molecules, right? So there, this is used, this path is not used only to produce energy, but to produce many building blocks of uh, nucleic acids, amino acids, hormones, and so on. Because just once you have this reaction in place, why not use the intermediate? So for other purposes. Another thing, when I was talking to you about glycolysis, I was pointing to you this enzyme called phosphorylkinase, right? which is, I believe, yeah, I have it here. This is the enzyme right here in um, cellular respiration. Why was I pointing to you is because this is a key enzyme for the uh, inhibition and activation of cellular respiration. This is a target of several molecules, which are product of cellular respiration, which can either inhibit it or stimulate its activity. This is done through allosteric inhibition or activation. You remember when we talked about the enzymes? Allosteric enzymes or allosteric inhibitors, or regulatory molecules, they bind to a site different than the active site. That's what we're talking about here. Some uh, molecules produced by cellular respiration can bind to a site different than the active site of phosphofructokinase. And this binding, can lead to the inhibition of this enzyme or the activation. Which one are they? Well, not surprisingly, 
you have that citrate one of the products here of the citric acid cycle and atp which is ultimately the final product of this are inhibitors are allosteric inhibitors of phosphofructokinase why well because if you start having a lot of atp or citrate it means that you have already done this once. You don't need more energy to be done. And so what you want is to inhibit one of the first enzymes to stop the process. You don't want to waste energy. You don't want to produce intermediate that might not be needed. Not surprisingly, instead, ADP, high level of ADP, will actually stimulate this enzyme to turn on. They turn it on. So they work. ADP works as an allosteric activator, in this case, of this enzyme. Because if you have high level of ADP, it means you're running out of energy. You need more of that. So you have to stimulate the overall cellular respiration path, pathway here. And this is the same slide basically saying how ATP and citrate ultimately are allosteric inhibitors of phosphofructokinase, whereas ADP is an allosteric um, uh, activator of the same enzyme. So if there is a lot of ATP or citrate. There is no need to produce more energy. You stop cellular respiration at this level. Anything downstream is not produced anymore. Vice versa, you need energy. You turn it on, everything starts flowing again. Cellular respiration restarts. That's an example of feedback inhibition that we were using when we we're talking about regulation of enzymes. Finally, let's get to the end of this lecture here. So now, um, the whole process of cellular respiration is not performed by all living organisms, but only those that have mitochondria. Okay. Sometimes, even ourselves too, um, you find yourself, there are some organisms, first of all, that don't have mitochondria, or we might have situations which we are hypoxic. We cannot do the mitochondrial part of cellular respiration ultimately. And so some organisms particularly, they stop basically performing only glycolysis. But together, they with that, in order to keep glycolysis doing, they have to do also a process referred to as fermentation. Now, there are two types of fermentation. There's lactate fermentation and alcohol fermentation. Different organisms do one or the other. We can actually do lactate fermentation too in our skeletal muscles, for example, when we are running out, running out of oxygen there. So what happens there? Basically, these organisms, all of them, whether they do lactate or alcohol fermentation, the only way in which they can produce ATP is through um, gl uh, glycolysis. Okay, if you remember, glycolysis lead to the production of two ATP molecules and two NADH molecules. The problem you have is that, that if you rely only on glycolysis, is that over time you will run out of NAD+. If you keep going, 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 all NAD+, will be converted to NADH. You run out of that. So these organisms, whether they do lactate or alcohol fermentation, have developed further pathways to basically restore the NAD plus pool. And they do that, again, in two different ways. So organisms that do lactate fermentation, such as those that are involved in the production of yogurt, as you can see in that pic, they restore the NAD plus by converting the end, pro, end product of glycolysis, which is pyruvate, so the ATP has been produced, NADH has been produced, but now they restore the NADH into NAD plus by converting pyruvate into lactate. Our muscles do that as well when we are running out of oxygen. We cannot run out of NAD plus as well. To keep going, they convert the pyruvate into lactate, which then can be converted back into pyruvate in our case and enter the rest of the uh, respiratory pathway when oxygen comes back. So some organism can perform lactate fermentation, and in this case, pyruvate is converted into lactate, hence the name lactate fermentation, and these allow to the restoration of NAD plus from NADH um, molecules. The second type of fermentation is the one that is involved in the production of alcohol. It's called alcohol fermentation. It occurs in yeast. And in this case, you have that pyruvate, instead of being converted into lactate, is converted first into acetaldehyde, ultimately into ethanol. Okay. And this process, again, 
use the electron and the proton from NADH, therefore restoring NAD plus as well. So no matter what type of fermentation you're talking about, whether it leads to the production of lactate or alcohol, our final goal is to restore the NAD plus so that glycolysis can keep going in these organisms so more ATP can be produced uh, over time. Finally, now not all organisms um, now we talked about how this basically leads to the transfer of all these electrons to oxygen. Some organisms do not use oxygen as a final acceptor. So there are some organisms, such as bacteria and archaea, ultimately can transfer these electrons to other groups that can be easily reduced, such as sulfate, nitrate, or ferric uh, ion. Now, there are also some organisms, as you know, that based on their behavior in the presence of oxygen, whether they can live with that or not, are grouped into different groups. So there are some organisms that are strictly aerobes, so meaning they can only live um, in the presence of oxygen. They cannot, they would die if there is no, no oxygen around. Some other organism they can live either in the presence or absence of oxygen. They will be referred as a facultative Arabs organisms. There are some others are referred to as anaerobes organisms that can only live in um, in the absence of oxygen. If you add some oxygen, oxygen will be very toxic to them. Some of them have developed also a pathway to overcome the presence of oxygen, and they do that by basically converting oxygen into um, uh, some different forms, some uh, radicals and oxygen peroxide first, and so on. So trying to remove basically all the oxygen present in the air that will be toxic to them. In summary, we are done. What did we talk about here? We talked about cellular respiration. So this process that is shared by all living organisms in parts or in the full extent, depending on what we're talking about, simple prokaryotes or complex uh, eukaryotes. Now, this process, we went through so all the different steps. We talked about glycolysis, pyrite oxidation, citric acid cycle, and ultimately the oxidative phosphorylation, a step where most of the ATP is produced. So it uh, consists of the electron transfer a chain first, and then you have chemiosmosis leading to the formation of ATP. Finally, we talked also about the efficiency of uh, in percentage of cellular respiration we calculate that efficiency and we talked about also how cellular respiration is regulated we talked also about it's not in this slide but how other energy rich molecules can enter cellular respiration or how some products of cellular respiration can be used to produce other molecules now we talked about oxygen cellular respiration we talked about the process of fermentation alcohol and lactic fermentation and how organisms can be classified based on their capacity or not to live in the presence of oxygen. So as can, can be classified as aerobic, anaerobic, or facultative aerobic organisms.